Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. I'm Joshua. We love scary old-time radio stories. There's nothing quite like a disembodied voice telling a genuinely disturbing tale. But do these stories stand the test of time, or are we being deceived by nostalgia? Are they suspenseful or forgettable? Bone-chilling or butt-numbing? That's what we're here to find out. This week, I chose The Screaming Skull from Theater 1030, a horror series originally broadcast on the CBC in Canada sometime between 1968 and 1971. That's as much information as anybody on the internet seems to know. Scary Canada 1968. That is it. However, we can tell you about the story itself. The Screaming Skull is based on a short story of the same name by Francis Marion Crawford, originally published in 1908. Crawford was an Italian-American writer and historian known for a series of colorful novels set in Italy and, more pertinent to the podcast, several classic stories of the weird and supernatural, including The Upper Birth, The Dead Smile, The Doll's Ghost, and, of course... The Screaming Skull. In 1958, The Screaming Skull was adapted into a low-budget horror film shot over six weeks in one location. The film was less than faithful to the original story and gave no on-screen credit to Crawford. Considering the film's terrible reviews, this is probably in Crawford's favor. Forty years later, the film was resurrected and ridiculed by Mystery Science Theater 3000. But don't worry. The radio version is much, much better. So without further ado... Here is The Screaming Skull from Theater 1030, originally broadcast sometime, somewhere, in Canada. Forget the petty distractions around you. Forget what you think you know. Forget everything but what you hear right now. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music. And listen to the voices. Time to tell tales of the unaccountable, of apparitions by night and phantoms in shadow. Time to tell strange stories of fantasy and the supernatural. Theater 1030 presents The Screaming Skull, a tale of the supernatural by George Selverson, based on a story by E. Marion Crawford, and starring Tommy Tweed as the captain and Hugh Webster as James. It is, James. Nice place for an old sea dog to retire to. It's a pretty little property, just a thing for an old sailor like me who's taken to gardening. <laughs> you won't be gardening in this weather. That's true, James. Let's get in out of the wet. Listen to the wind and the sea. You must feel right at home here. At home? Come in. Come in, James. Close the door. Right. Sit there by the fire. I'll put something in a glass to warm you. Wonderful. Ah, it's a night for a burning log on the hearth. And for Holland Jid. <laughs> this is the same I brought Luke from Amsterdam 25 years ago. <laughs> he never touched a drop of it. Luke was your cousin, Captain Braddock, wasn't he? He was. That's how I came by this house. After he died and his boy Charlie was killed in South Africa, there were no relations left. Here now, see if this doesn't warm your blood, James. (laughs) Thank you. Wasn't there a Mrs. Pratt? Yes. Yes, yes, there was. What happened to her? Well, she died before Luke. (coughs) Uh, Strong stuff, Captain. 
You can hear the tide. Gloomy sound, isn't it? Yes. Do you remember the German ship we sailed on? Did you hear that, Captain? Yes. Someone screamed. It must be from the beach. No, it isn't from the beach. Oh, someone may be in trouble. We'd best have a look. Sit down, James. No one's in trouble. Well, why do you say that? You said you heard it too? What's interesting is that you heard it, James. Ooh, what do you mean by that? There are always people who think it's the wind or my imagination. Then what was it? Put another stick on the fire, will you? Yes. It's only something to do with the wind and the tide. Yeah, this is good enough for old sailors like us, James. I don't think Mary Pratt was very happy here. Hmm. Might be a little gloomy for a woman at that. Poor woman. I suppose in a way I was responsible for her death. What's that, Captain? It was on a night like this. I was at home for a spell, waiting to take the Olympia out on her first trip. Is that the voyage when she broke the record? No, that was the next one. Oh. But that dates it. Hmm, 1892? In November. Mm-hmm. In this very room it was. Oh, the weather was dirty. Pratt was in his usual bad temper, and poor Mary Pratt's dinner was a failure. You see that, Captain? My wife is trying to poison me. Luke, he's, he's joking, Mary. Oh, I wish he were joking. <laughs> Welsh rabbit, raw turnip, and half-boiled mutton. Charles, if you ever marry, don't marry a fool. You see what he thinks of me? You see how he goes on? On second thought, perhaps it's better to marry a woman foolish enough to poison you with Welsh rabbit. Instead of spun glass, a chalk <laughs> horsehair. Oh, 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 you see, Luke's only joking. After all, he's a doctor. He knows all the antidotes, eh, Luke? Not for some things. Oh, of course. There was that woman in Ireland, the one who did for three husbands before anyone suspected a thing. Be glad you aren't married to one like that, Luke. How did she manage it? Well, her fourth husband managed to keep awake after she drugged him and caught her at it. Caught her at what? Well, she had a little horn funnel, and she put it into his ear. Oh, 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 oh. this sounds rather ridiculous, old man. <laughs> well, that's what he thought, until he saw her coming with a ladle filled with melted lead. That's rather funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's terrible. Charles, that's awful. Oh, don't you dare tell such a story here ever again. <laughs> Yeah. In this very room it was. James, if I were you, I would never tell ugly stories about ingenious ways of killing people. Listen. What? You heard that sound again, Captain? No, that was the wind backing up to the southern again. I can tell by the sound. Are you trying to tell me that Mrs. Pratt killed her husband? No, she couldn't have. You see, she died that same November. Good heavens, man. Yes, Luke was a lonely man after that. Lonely? Oh, I could see it. I came to see him now and then. And he looked lonely? Oh, yes. Very worn and nervous. That last time I saw him, there was the thing about the dog. Thing about a dog? Yes. Luke was so thin, his head looked like a skull with parchment stretched over it. And his eyes had a sort of glare. He glared at me when I asked about the dog. I killed the dog. That sweet tempered old bulldog. I could stand it no longer, Charles. Well, the, the dog was ill. Oh, no. But he used to climb into that chair where you're sitting now. Yes? That was my wife's chair, you know. Well... I know, Luke, but after all... You never saw him do it. Old Bumble used to sit there and stare at me. We'd stare at each other, thinking over old times. And then and the fool dog would begin to shake all over and set up a howl as if he'd been shot, and then he'd run and hide under the sideboard, making the strangest 
noises. Why, poor old Bumble. I couldn't stand it. He didn't suffer at all, Charles. I put dianine into his drink to make him sleep soundly. And then I chloroformed him gradually so that he couldn't have suffered even in a dream. He didn't suffer. Well, I... I believe you, Lou. He didn't suffer a bit. And it's been quieter since then. He said, it's been quieter since then. Now I know what he meant. He meant that he didn't hear that noise so often. Perhaps he thought at first that it was old Bumble in the yard howling at the moon. Perhaps that's what he thought. It's not that kind of noise at all, is it, James? That sound. What is it, Captain? Don't be frightened, man. It won't eat you. It's only a noise. And a noise never hurt anyone. That's all very well, but what is it? When I don't understand a thing, I call it a phenomenon. And I don't take it for granted that it's going to kill me. Besides, what is there to prove Luke killed his wife? Is there a connection? Did I say there was? Well, you were. What did they say she died of? She died in bed a few days after I told that story. But of what? A heart trouble. But you don't believe that. Why not? Luke called in another doctor and he believed it. But you don't. Of course I believe it. Only, only pour yourself another drop and I'll show you something. I think I will. I keep it locked in this old roller top desk of Luke's. That's where I found it, you know. Ah, here we are. You mean that pistol? No, no, no. That's the old pistol I bought in Rio for a souvenir when you and I went ashore. You remember the Leofic, James? Mm hmm. Grand vessel. Sail. Those were the days, James. What were you going to show me? I imagine Luke was fond of deep sea fishing. And probably use this for casting a sinker for a night line. Do you think, James? An iron ladle? You can but see there. It was hardened in the bottom of the bowl. The melted lead. <laughs> Why, James? You dropped your drink. I'll get you another. You won't mention this, will you? After all, Luke's dead now, with an honest man's tombstone at his head. There was trouble enough about his death as it was. No reason for James Treherne to hear about a thing like this later. Here you are. Thanks. James Treherne? He's the sexton and he works in my garden. Works in your garden. Oh, I, I, I didn't tell you about that. It was when I retired and having inherited the property from poor old Luke, I moved in. This James Treherne showed me through the house and told me the story and showed me the thing in the cupboard. A curious thing to keep in the cupboard? I mean, when you consider this here the bedroom. This hat box? Hmm. Same as they found by old Luke down on the beach. When he died? <sighs> That's right. You remember the verdict? By the hands or teeth of some person or animal unknown. I know. I know. I heard all about that. Some big dog chewed him to death. That don't horrify you, Captain. Oh, I suppose. I've seen a good deal around this world, however. Hmm. Have you ever seen a bit of interior decoration like this? What is it? Hot box. Open it up, Captain. Oh, 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 oh. You're, you're very mysterious, Fern. All right, I'll open it up. Uh, very pretty. And polished. And white, ain't it, Captain? A skull. Yeah, it's what it is, all right. Found by him when he was dead. There on the beach. Oh, what of it? Luke was a doctor. It's 
Not unusual for a doctor to have a thing like this. Mm, but it is unusual for a thing like this to roll. Huh? When he fell dead, mind you, not down the slope of the beach towards his feet, but up the slope of the beach toward his head. Oh, you what? He rolled up the beach. Oh. From where the open hat box was found. Oh, 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 oh. Yes. phenomenon. Mm, this here phenomenon lay right up against his poor throat, all broken and bruised by, like you say, Captain, some big dog. Now, do you notice something else? No. Here, take it. Well, give it a shake. Huh? Go on, shake it. What? Oh, oh, oh all right. Mm-hmm, no. You got a peculiar sound? There's, there's something inside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty small thing I shape to it. Perfect teeth. Well, it's only a medical specimen. I wonder where the lower jaw got to. With them teeth, she would have had a pretty smile. Who did you get up to? what he said. After that, I got something into my head. Oh, I don't mean anything supernatural. As far as that goes, I'd rather face any shape of ghost than a fog in the channel when it's crowded, eh, James? Oh, what was it you got into your head? Oh, no, there's no sense to it. Didn't she have a Christian burial? Oh, certainly. She's lying in the churchyard where for her and put her to rest. It's monstrous. To suppose her husband kept her skull in her old hat box in the bedroom. Eh? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Captain, you play me for a fool. Pour me another drink. Yes, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I suppose he had done. I mean, the ladle and the melted lead and all that. But then, why did he do this other thing? Yes. Why? He could have been afraid of something else that I told him when I told that story. What? Well, the woman that did for those three husbands, they dug up the three skulls, you know. And? And in each, there was a small lump of lead rattling around. That's what hanged her. I suppose he'd remember that with the vital evidence. <laughs> Captain Charlie Braddock. <laughs> you old fraud, you see, do you? Pirate, you old devil. Okay. <laughs> Get me another drink. Heaven, <laughs> what is so funny? Do you invite me here to this this haunted looking cottage of yours yeah. by the gloomy sea, and you set me down by your fireplace here and spin me a yarn like <laughs> <laughs> you old lying fraud of a sailor. Lord, he'd remember that was the vital evidence. I've often wondered how he managed it. What do you suppose he put in its place? Do you mean that sound came from your bedroom, James? Let me tell you about the night I tried to get rid of the thing. It's not happy anywhere else, you know. It wants to be in Mary Pratt's hat box... In that cupboard. At least I think it does. I sleep in Luke's old surgery now, you know. But then when I first came, I slept in the bedroom. Well, I slept well. Who do you know an old sailor? No natural sound disturbs you. Not all the racket of a square rigger hove to in a heavy gale. But any unnatural sound, and you wake in a moment. That's how it was every night at exact. Please, 17 minutes past three. I wonder if that was the hour she died. Then I would hear it and be exploded into a wakeful terror. What? Not again? I won't 
have that again. I, I, I won't stand this anymore. Now, I'm going to settle this. I'll take you and... Yes, the window. There. Here you go, hat marks and all out the window. Hearing deafen me, but never let me hear that again. I would not stop screaming. Then, when I thought I would go mad, it fell silent. I sat on my bed, listening, waiting. Hours passed. Then I heard a totally unexpected sound. Oh, someone at the door. You can't see the door from above. I called out. Who's there? Who is it? Who could it be, I thought? Oh, some old country fellow, stone deaf. I took my candle and went down to open the door. I set my candle down on the hall table. And then, when I opened the door, the wind blew it out. There was no one there. I shut the door. I lit the candle. There it was, at my feet, where the wind blew it in. The light and shadow from the candle playing in the hollows of it. So the eyes seemed to open and shut at me. We stared at each other. I spoke to it. What do you want? It wanted to go back to its cupboard. I knew that. But I stared at it. And I refused to move. I stared, and it stared back, and I waited. All right, all right, all right. I hurried outside. I found that box. I ran inside put the thing in the box and returned it to its cupboard in the bedroom. After that, I slept in Luke's old surgery. <laughs> but still, it screams at me. It hates me. I was the one who told Luke the story, you know. Listen, James. What? The wind and the tide. Captain, do you have to go on with this story? Can't we talk about old times? Yes, yes, old times. Yes. Remember old Block Lot? Ah, a carpenter, wasn't he? Yes. On the clock top. <laughs> I remember. He used to say, when we were hove to in a howling gale. I remember, I remember. Biddy, Devour, Bemel, Shore, his night pies. <laughs> that's, that's just the way he'd say it. Yes, and always on a night like this. <laughs> Listen. Oh. So that's what it is. Oh, James. <laughs> <laughs> you old fraud. That's the classic sound of wind howling in the chimney. James, <laughs> I'll get the thing and show it to you. Here's the box. That's it? Yes. My candle went out as I brought it downstairs. Well, uh, put the box down. It went out. But that was the draft from the leaky window on the landing. Put it down. Yes. Did you hear anything when I went up? Yes. 
There was another scream. Whatever that scream came from, it wasn't from this. No, I had the box in my hand when I heard the noise. And here it is now. So we have proved definitely that the screams are produced by something else. But tell me, to think I could have been so weak as to fancy that the poor skull could really cry out like a living thing with the agony of melted lead poured through the ear into its brain. Then don't talk that way, Captain. No, no, I, I, I won't. Well, if you're going to show me Luke's medical specimen, open the box. Yes, yes, I will, James. You see how carefully I wrapped it in brown butcher's paper and tied it with string. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at it under the bright lamp. It's awful to think that the poor lady used to sit there in your chair mm -hmm. where the dog Bumble later stared at Luke in just the same lamplight. Oh, come, come now, Captain... Let's have a look at the See? Here's the label I put on it. To seal the string. And here's what I wrote. Hmm. Once the property of the late Luke Pratt, M.D. One skull. Hmm. Well, open it, Captain. I often wondered what sort of hat it was. It came in this box. What kind of hat? A gay spring hat. With a bobbing feather and pretty ribbons. Strange if this same box should hold the head that wore Open that... Open it. Yes, yes. Open it. Oh. <laughs> Strange. I don't have the strength in my hands anymore, James. Can you break the string? Yes. <coughs> there. Now. Oh. oh, good Lord, take the lamp, the window. James, the lamp. Close that window, Captain. Yes, yes, yes. I close the window, but don't let the lamp go out if you can help. How can I help it if you don't close the blasted window? Now, shut out that gale. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The bolt was only half down. It won't blow open again. That's the advantage of these old-fashioned windows with the bolt. Now, the hat box. Where is it? Where? Did it blow off the table? Oh, must be here. Ah, here it is, on the floor. Ah. Hand it up there, will you, James? There you are. Now, open it. Here. You see? The lid comes off easily enough. There. Now, look, James. At what? There's nothing in the box. What? Empty? Hmm. Empty, Captain. No, that must not be. Captain, there never was a skull, was there? There were a skull? No skull. You imagined the whole thing. Yeah, yes. Yes, I imagined it. <laughs> Turn up the lamp. Yes. You've been living alone too long, old friend. I can't understand. Do you suppose the sextant Traherne suspects something? Do you suppose he could have stolen it? Why would he steal it? What's that? On the floor. Where? There, by your foot. Oh, Captain, for heaven's sake, nothing. Nothing at all, but... But this... But what? This... <clears throat> Did I get it? Then you... Did listen to the story. And the thing does hate me. And this fell out just now when the box blew to the floor. It hates me. Why would it hate you? Because I told the story. And there you have the end of the story. A round ball of lead. Then, where's the skull? want me to answer? No. No. I'm not going to answer it, Captain. It hates me. I told Luke the story. How did it get out of the box this time? This is no affair. Yeah. Captain, 
I'm going. Are you coming? Where? Out the other way, the back way. No. It hates me. It blames me. Then I'm going. You can come or not. No, it hates me. Come with me, Captain. Leave this and come with me. No. Then God help you. Because I can't. <laughs> James. James! What do you want of me? Don't do that. Don't. I know, I know the frightful agony, the hot lead, the melted metal searing into the brain. Don't blame me. Remember, James? No, I won't answer. Don't blame me. Don't blame me. I won't open the door. I knew what you wanted. Theater 1030 has presented The Screaming Skull, a tale of the supernatural by Marion Crawford, adapted for radio by George Salverson, with Hugh Webster as James, Tommy Tweed as the captain, Drew Thompson as Luke, Marion Waldman as Mary, his wife, and Eric Clavering as Trelevin. Sound effects were by John Fliz. Technical operation, Robert Burt. This is Bill Lauren speaking. That was The Screaming Skull from the series Theater 1030 here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. I'm Joshua. And we'd like to welcome you to the final uh, <laughs> podcast ever because <laughs> we have now heard the absolute best old time radio show <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever done, ever. <laughs> Uh, does that tell you where I'm leaning on this one? Uh, we're done with the podcast. <laughs> I don't want to talk about any other ones. It's stupid to move forward. Holy crap, that was awesome. That was absolutely fantastic. I loved everything about it. So there. <laughs> We've been the mysterious old radio listening society. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. What was yeah. the one I liked that you brought, Tim, uh, a few weeks ago? Uh, horn? Did you like the horn? The horn. The horn from and I Fear love the horn. This beats it. Wow. Uh, this is, and I really enjoyed the horn. I can't tell you how much sitting through this, it escalated where I was saying, all right, all right, all right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lump of letter skull. <laughs> it never disappointed me. I don't have one note that I went, well, this was kind of weird. Tim? Uh, I enjoyed it very much. I don't know if it was that I was listening to it and distracted or was something like that, but it plugged into a way of experiencing things for me where it was very dreamlike. Hmm. It was not a plot of this happened and then this happened and this happened. And it's also the time jumped around so much. Yep. It was much more an experience just a experiential of this is happening several times. This is happening and it was unnerving. And I really enjoyed that. <laughs> right. And the sound was so unnerving. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That scream is and, something else. Oh my God. I'm still not entirely convinced. I really know what happened. Not just like the, Oh, the plot was confusing. It's like, did this actually happen or was this guy nuts? Oh, it happened. <laughs> Um, as long as the scream just came up with Tim, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, uh, this is something that I planned. Okay. Um, 
the scream was very remindful to me of something else. Do you remember, and I know Joshua does because we did a whole sketch based on this, <laughs> the thrilling, chilling sounds of the haunted house oh, by yes, Disney? Yep. Okay. Do you remember the scream in that album that we used to play on Halloween? So that's that scream, right? <laughs> Very close. It's so close. It yeah. tells you that context is everything because that is not startling in the middle of a podcast, for example. But you said it in Cornwall on a blowing, windy night. Yeah. Lighthouse mm-hmm. or what you inherited from your crazy cousin. Crazy, violent, murdering cousin. <laughs> right. I will say I do have one. Was it a lighthouse? Did I just put it in a lighthouse for no I reason? I think you just put it in a lighthouse. I wasn't going to wow. call you Man. out on that, but um, wow, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one small, tiny little thing that if I was directing this, I would have done. When the scream occurred, they played music with it, the sting with it. Doesn't need the sting. Just have the thing scream. That's a very tiny thing. Uh, I noticed that, and I actually liked it because oh, it is okay. so unlike how other sound effects are done in a lot of old-time radio. Obviously, this isn't from a later era, late 60s, we think, early 70s. Yeah. But at some point, you go, how do you differentiate these sound effects that people have been doing at that point for, you know, 30 years to scare people? And there was something about incorporating that sound. It, It made everything ambivalent. Are we listening to the wind? Are we listening to a musical effect? Is it a scream? And it goes back to Tim's point of going like, are we really hearing this? And that is the sailor's question to his old friend. Right. You know, are, are you hearing this? Am I hearing this? Is it the wind? Is it just coming through the chimney? It's this dance. And I, the reason I love this story is that it is a very, very, very traditional ghost story, yet at the same time, a complete and utter subversion of ghost stories. Yeah. In that most of the time, the teller of a ghost story, right, is 100% sold on the ghost story, right? They are trying to scare the hell out of you, whether you're just kids sitting around a campfire or, 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 or you're in a narrative story. Or please believe me. Yeah, mm-hmm. begging you. Somehow they're trying to sell this right. story. Correct. Here we have this situation in which the teller is ambivalent. They're looking for a way out of the ghost story. Well, they that. are worrying it like a bone, like a dog with a bone, <laughs> like kind of circling it constantly. And every time there's a tiny little chink in the armor of the ghost story, he tries to get out. And it just keeps going. No matter how obvious the ghost elements or the supernatural elements come, he, mm. he plays it off. And I, I just found that dizzying. And I think that goes to the dream quality that you were describing, Tim. Yeah. Right? yeah because right. he's, he's trying throughout the entire thing to convince himself. And there's this, also this element of guilt. I think the reason he's trying so desperately to naturalize the supernatural is because to call it a supernatural incident is to admit his guilt in telling this oh, story right, right, over right. dinner. Yeah, and there's yeah. this theme of guilt throughout the entire well, thing. She hates me. And, and, and trying to justify your actions from even the little story of Luke when he – a terrible story of him killing the dog. Bungles, the yeah. dog because yep. – and, and he's like – he's quick to justify, but it was so humane. <laughs> Unlike what I yeah. did to my wife. It was so it was so <laughs> humane and the dog didn't feel anything. And even at the very end when James, his friend, he needs to verbalize to the captain, like, please come with me. We're leaving this cottage, we're leaving this house right now. And then the captain won't go and he's like, Just no, I that I can't do anything for you. Even God can't do anything for you. He's like again, this sort of justification that I am not responsible for this. It's right. of, it's it's really intricate and throughout it. And I read the short story. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a really faithful adaptation, a really interesting adaptation to make a few changes to accommodate audio. In the short story, it is a monologue just from the captain's point of view. You don't hear any friend there. It's all of his voice. So you can really interpret this as a crazy person just talking to themselves. I will say that if you have not seen the movie that we talked about in the beginning of this podcast, The Screaming Skull, that was ridiculed by Mystery Science Theater 3000. I highly encourage you to watch the movie on Mystery Science Theater 3000 because it is a hilarious episode. Uh, when you gave me this, when you sent this to me, and I saw Screaming Skull, I immediately looked it up and went, not that movie. 
I'm like, is it based on that terrible movie? And and it was. And I was like, oh no, this is gonna. Is it, did Joshua pick a dud just to see what we do with it? It Does evoke this vision of some hilarious little object on the table and. Wah! Wah! <laughs> I think that's why it's so good because it could be so comically absurd. It's it, uh, it never gets there though. No. no. It never even the rolling up the beach at him on while he's dying and everything like oh man. I mean, this this is a In strength. the movie by the way, it does the rolling and you can just almost see, the see no no not a string, the guy that rolled it. You <laughs> can see hand. His, his hand <laughs> in the screen as he rolls it. But yeah, considering this story ends with a skull knocking on your door, that okay. that should be absurd beyond words, right? 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 It's terrifying. It's... And I love the lead in the ear part of this. Like, that's a crazy way to kill someone. Well, the and... evolution of that into a bullet. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, the dog thing you were talking about, uh, that was a really interesting part for me where, as animal lovers, as we all are, like, oh, no, here comes the dog killing thing. The remorsefulness, I wasn't cruel. It, he went quick. All of that was actually... A little disturbing to listen to him describe how he was trying to convince himself that what he did was right. And that was terrifying in a very sad, sad way. You know, he killed the dog because the dog knew what he'd done. Yeah. And that idea that maybe Luke was hearing the screaming skull, too, and blaming it on the dog. Like yeah, it was howling. There, there's this yeah, ambivalent. Once the dog moment. was dead, he heard it less. Yes, which suggests that he wasn't even hearing the dog. That he killed this dog. Well, he killed the dog for nothing, no matter what. <laughs> right. But, uh, but it was still that guilt in his head, which adds to this other layer of: is this just a sort of psychosis? <laughs> is it real or is it not? Um, Did you like that scene as much as I enjoyed the scene of him staring down the skull at the door? Oh they, yeah, they that's, stare that's at each straight other. from the story, and it's and so looking at each other. Beautiful. He's talking the light and shadow from the candle playing in the hollow of it, so the eyes seem to open and shut at me. Right, and we <laughs> stared at each other. That is an evocative. And I image. talked to it. Yeah. At that point, you got to okay, dude. <laughs> what do you want? And how are you knocking? <laughs> yeah, I was just like head butting the door. I just like. Again, it's the beauty of it. It keeps you from getting to those absurd levels, right? Yeah. Which, which in a, a story that was written without as much sophistication, you would question these things. Now, Tim is right, and I never thought about this. It never occurred to me. Because I guess I want to believe it so bad. Uh, in the, not believe it. Uh, I want the story to be that, yes, there is a skull that's screaming, and it's not the chimney. But now that I'm thinking about what Tim said, because I never thought about it that way, let me take that back. I did think about it that way because it was led to us that, am I crazy? Am I not crazy? Am I imagining this? Now that I think about it, they've really led us in a lot of ways to th- believe that he probably was. There's no skull in the hat box at the end, just a metal piece of lead, right? Yeah. We never open the door to find out who's knocking at the end. So, yeah, I guess it, re- it really could be just... The rantings of a crazy man. Yet at the same time, if we believe that, then we have let him off the hook. That's what he wants us to believe because he's he's trying those on for size. He's trying every theory that could possibly explain this on at every moment, which if I this, think is the brilliance of the story. If this is all in his head and it's the guilt from telling that story where she got so mad at him and he's felt guilty ever since, right? Possibly, as he said, I killed her. Right, like he gave the idea mm-hmm. yeah. to have her killed, and I'm responsible for this. And he's living with this guilt that is manifesting itself in these hallucinations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he is looking for uh, absolution. Yeah. None of this is actually happening, but he really needs this guy. He's invited over to say, "No, this isn't really happening." Yeah. And then he can or say, yeah, it is really happening. There's a skull here, and it's doing the stuff that you think it is. In in this story, his friend James. By the end, is really like, I don't know if it's the skull, but something really weird is happening in this house. I, I don't, well, I don't trust forget- to leave you alone here. I want you to leave right now. Let's go out of the back. Let's not answer this door. But here, this, there's another small setup in this thing that is quick and thrown away and beautiful. How strong the liquor is at the beginning. Yeah. And James is hammered. <laughs> You're right. So the story and the things he's hearing and all of this is also being compounded by the fact that he's drinking some homemade something that's mm-hmm. helping. Yeah. <laughs> this so we don't know what James is actually hearing and what he's manifesting. You know what I'm saying at that point. He could be so wasted that <laughs> yeah. He's also imagining this. 
it's also interesting how this story can take something strange and yet somehow make it feel authentic and make you believe in the scenario more. The fact that this skull wants to be in that hat box in the in, in the her cabin, bedroom. Yeah. And for some yeah. reason that's odd, but for some reason it somehow seems more r- real. He says, I don't know if that's what it wants, but I think that's what it wants. Yeah, because he's just, I think it's his desperation to figure it out. Like, if I can, if I can figure out why this is happening, I can make it go away. Oh, yeah. What's, and can this, I placate her? Can I? Yes. And that, and right, that right. feels authentic. That feels like what you would really do. Like, how, dear God in heaven, how <laughs> can I make this stop? I, I will put her back in her little magic spot in that great moment when he's showing the skull or trying to show the skull to James when he's like just gonna bring this up yeah oh I wonder what kind of hat it was isn't it ironic that yeah. it's you know there's another this... interesting moment in that though when he's showing James the hat box that he can't open it my hands are too feeble can you open this which means that he has not opened that thing either he can't or won't or is unable to mentally there's a possibility he's never opened up that hat box ever yeah there was the peculiar, and I don't necessarily have a, a conclusion about this, but the, the plot point of the reason the skull was not buried with the rest of the body was because this original killer that he was telling the story about, the, uh, she was found out because of the skull of these three victims. Mm-hmm. Because they found the, 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 metal, lead, yeah. the lead in the skulls. Which created some great, very small foley in there. That, 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 yeah, that yeah. sound of that <laughs> rattle yeah, yeah. in Rattling, the skull. Yeah. Ugh. But yeah, that is expanded on a little bit mm. in the short story. So again, I can't recommend enough reading the short story. Yeah, and I can't recommend enough watching the Mystery Science Theater. That <laughs> I just want to wrap this up uh, for time and whatever, but my one last note I wanted to... Uh, it's not. It's ridiculous, but uh, the thing screams at 3.17 a.m., right? Yeah. Do you remember Amityville Horror it was 3.15 a.m.? Why is everything at that time of the morning when everything bad happens? Like, I thought of, I wrote a bunch of them down, but it doesn't matter. There's a bunch of scary stuff where at 3.15, yeah. that's the moment. Yeah, cause is it because that's the dead of night? It's not late at night. It's not early morning yet. It is exactly what you said. Well, I'll I shattered to, that. I'll yes. see if I can <laughs> look it up and put it in the actual uh, post we do for this. But the witching hour, people normally think is midnight, but it's not actually as to what the witching hour is. And it might be that it's later, It's that it's like 3. Good. That'd be, because, that'd be awesome this happens, that's true. Right, right. But this <laughs> happens a lot, right? In stories, it's 3.15. This one is 317, but it's right there, and I thought, found that interesting. Any other notes? I mentioned a little, and I, I, the jumps in time, the storytelling jumps back and forth between the flashbacks and that. Like, where are we? What's happening? Yeah, and I think it, it goes back to the captain having this sort of attraction anxiety. He wants to tell the story. He doesn't want to tell the story. If he tells the story, he's admitting some sort of guilt, or he's admitting that it's true, but he's searching for this cathartic moment by telling it. And I think that's where the Are you up. saying, though, that the way they did it Technically, in the production, was hard to follow. Like there wasn't like a (laughs) something that divided that for you, so you knew you were back in time and then back. And I can't put that on the production because, again, I was maybe a little distracted while I was listening to this. But that it kept catching me a surprise of like, no, no, we're not where I thought I was. Well, I listened to it twice, and I would say there was a couple moments where I went, "Oh, that's a flashback." So I'm with you on that. I, I think that that's hard to do in these radio dramas, and I think that you need to be very specific on we're going back in time, whether it's a do 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 do, you know, or, and whether or purposeful something. or not. I think it does serve the purpose that Joshua was saying of this push pull on the on the flash on the story he's telling of like I, I want to tell it, I don't want to tell it. It's like I think this narrative boxing where he's like dodging and weaving. He he doesn't want anything to really land on him at any moment. I, I think there's also the idea that he may be slipping back and forth in time. While he's telling it. And and I think that comes through in the production of this. Like, all of a sudden, he's actually there again. So, uh, thank you, Joshua. Yeah. That was uh, terrifying. Uh, we listen to these in all sorts of different ways when we send them to each other. This one, unfortunately for me, was in bed in the dark. <laughs> yeah. And I was mad <laughs> because, oh, no. Please don't scream. She's screaming again. Terrible. Yeah, this is one of those ones that, that it was perfect because I just decided to listen to it right before bed. I sat down in the dark, like James and the captain, I had a drink, and I just <laughs> sat in the dark and listened to it, and it was the perfect way to listen to this. Yeah, right? Yeah, I felt cozy and secure, and then I questioned all that coziness and security <laughs> as the story unfolded. 
I can't yeah. wait to play this for my 13 year old daughter and watch her freak out. <laughs> I think it's a timeless classic. Yes. I have to give a certain amount of credit to the original story by yeah. Crawford. Yeah. Yep. Um, F. Yeah, Mary and Crawford. They made some alterations to the end, and I don't want to talk about it because I think if someone wants to read it, it's very fun to figure out those differences yourself. Uh, but I think they made some smart decisions based on audio to the very end of it. But uh, yeah, so it, it. I would think it was expertly directed. Yeah. It's hard, as we found out in shows past, not all adaptations do well. Mm -hmm. And and you can screw them up. And I think they nailed what this intent was. Tim? Yes, uh, I think it's a timely classic. Well done. Beautiful. A little bit of agreement after last week's episode. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm glad we came back. Because remember when we quit and Uh, we were all fighting? Tough week. Tough week. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for listening, everybody. This is the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. If you want to learn more, please go to ghoulishdelights.com. You can find old episodes of this podcast, old antique episodes of this podcast. You can also learn information about our live performances because we do go out in the world and perform versions of scripts uh, of these sorts of shows. We uh, do it at the James J. Hill Center, and we'll also be performing these shows at the Fringe Festival here in Minnesota. Nice. You can also go to iTunes. And write a review. Please write a review. If you enjoyed this podcast even a little bit, give us a little bit of a review. We'd really (laughs) appreciate it. Thank you. In our next episode, we're going to listen to a request from one of our listeners for an episode of Suspense called To Find Help. Until next time.